Well, hi, everybody. I'm Don Stewart. Welcome to another edition of Breaking News. Today is Thursday, the 17th day of October 2024. And as always, we're going to look at the top stories of the day that have something to do with what the Bible says our world is going to be like at the time of the end of this present age before the second coming of Christ and the many, many events that are predicted to precede it. Now, in the headlines today, we find that today is Sukkot, or the Feast of Temporary Shelters, or Tabernacles, as it's more um, like regularly known to people. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that. It uh, began last night at sundown, and tonight, Israeli time at sundown. We also find out that Kamala Harris, at another headline, is on board with the administration's threat to withhold um, weapons to Israel unless they get their humanitarian game in order there in Gaza. Now, there's a great editorial from the New York Post. It's called Biden's Betrayal of Israel is a Clear Weakness Masquerading as Policy. And again, we've been saying this, but it's it's kind of says some of the same things we've been saying and adds a few other things, which we need to understand right now what's, what's going on with all that they continue to do. And finally, preparing to attack Iran guarantees to U.S. and there's Russian pressure and the possible targets. In other words, there's a lot of stories coming up with, that have to do with what still hasn't taken place, been over two weeks since Iran attacked Israel. It probably will come sometime next week. It won't come before Sunday because there's, as we're going to see, there's a meeting Netanyahu is going to have on Friday tomorrow, and then they're going to meet again on Sunday to determine what to do and when to do it. So it probably won't come till at least Sunday or Monday or sometime next week, and we'll be talking about all of that. All right, let's look at the headlines. Today is Sukkot. Feast of Temporary Shelters, or more popularly known as Tabernacles. It's commanded in Leviticus 23. It's an eight-day-long Jewish festival. According to the Hebrew calendar, Sukkot begins on the 15th day of the seventh month of the year called Tishri. Uh, this year, it's uh, Wednesday, October 16th, was the date. It changes every year because the Hebrew calendar is not the same as our calendar here. It begins at sundown, and the people of Israel, and actually Jews around the world, celebrate this by having uh, dwell in temporary shelters for seven days. Hence, it's called the Feast of Temporary Shelters, the Festival of Temporary Shelters, or Tabernacles, an old English word for temporary shelter, or booths. Um, temporary shelters is better because booths has the idea today, you know, if you go to some a place where they're selling something, got booths set up. Um, this is not the idea. It's uh, temporary shelters is what the, actually the word means here. All right. The crescendo is of this festival on the calendar. It, uh, you know, it's the last day where people rejoice. It's, in fact, it's the only festival where the people were commanded by God to rejoice and to celebrate it. Now, tragically, last year, the eighth day, which was the day they were supposed to celebrate uh, and supposed to be the most joyful at the end of Sukkot, was when that terrible event happened, October 7, 2023, with Hamas attack, of course, in southern Israel, the final day of Sukkot last year. The, it's the worst day in the history of the modern Jewish state. So it's going to be, a, you know, bittersweet. You're supposed to rejoice at it, but you remember the last year on your calendar at the same time, the last day, the rejoicing day is when this terrible event took place. All right. Now, why, why did God institute this? And it's real interesting. The main purpose was to remind the people of, uh, of Israel at the time, and then us, that how the Israelites lived for 40 years in shelters temporarily as they're wandering in the desert on the way to the promised land, although the Lord was continuing to guide them the whole time. They eventually got there, eventually made it. And as we've been talking about here, there was a number of, in Leviticus 23, a number of sacred assemblies that are commanded to take place. Uh, and during this uh, month, the seventh month, there were some of them there. Uh, three of them were to take place, as we've already mentioned, and were fulfilled at the first coming of Christ. And that is Passover, First Fruits, and the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost. And this was spring of the year. But in later in chapter 23, they moved to the seventh month of the year. And they talk about three other festivals or assemblies, sacred assemblies, actually is a better term. And that, of course, includes the so-called uh, trumpets in Leviticus 23, 23 to 25, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, and, of course, Sukkot, the last one, and uh, that's what we're dealing with. Now, as we've talked about here, the um, we've written about this because there are people that believe, and I understand that the reason for it makes some, will make some logical sense. There have been commentators that have held to this. That since you had three fulfilled at the beginning of the year and Israeli year, uh, Israel year in spring, 
the first three at the first coming. Let's how about the next three at the second coming? And that would be the trumpets, the trumpet blows. Then you've got the day of atonement. Then you've got the uh, tabernacles or the temporary shelters. And this has been a popular view that people have. And so every time we get to this year where it comes to coat tabernacles and uh, the first of the year, Yom, uh, Rosh Hashanah, as celebrated in the modern Israeli calendar, uh, people get excited because think this is the time the Bible predicts of the Lord's coming sometime in the fall. And as we said, that just doesn't work and for many reasons. In fact, in our book, um, 45 Common Mistakes About Last Day's Bible Prophecy Cleared Up, that's a free download on our website, Educating Our World Under the Heading of Bible Prophecy. Uh, it's number 43, mistake 43 is just that that um, there's the Bible's the fall feast don't give us a general time frame for the return of Christ. Not there. In fact, we list 18, 18, 1, 8 indisputable facts, what we know about this whole subject from the Bible. And when you go through it, as we do, and we're going to, like I said, we're going to record something uh, about it. And um, so you can just see, if you look at the totality of scripture, the entire picture, it just doesn't work for so, so many reasons there. So, uh, it doesn't give us a time frame for the return of Christ. Now, of course, he may return in the fall. Uh, it, it just doesn't have to. That's the whole point. And we should get excited any day. He can come any day. In fact, let's remember something else. He can come any day for us, too. And so anyway, that's um, Sukkot, though. It's But it reminds us again what Peter said. We're temporary residents here on this planet. Our home is in heaven. Philippians 3 tells us our home is with the Lord Jesus and um, we need to understand that we're just living here as temporary residents as Israel did during the time of the wilderness. And it's important we look at life that way, too, that everything we do um, is basically preparation for eternity. So if we start thinking that way and living that way, it's going to be a lot different the way we look at life. All right. So anyway, that's the date that it's today it's important that we recognize that. And the sad thing is, of course, last year on the eighth day of the festival, it's when that horrible event occurred with Hamas uh, uh, moving into southern Israel and the terrible things that they did. All right, headline number two, Kamala Harris is on board with the administration's threat to Israel. This is a Breitbart story. Vice President Kamala Harris said Wednesday that she supported the Biden-Harris administration's threat to Israel over humanitarian uh, conditions for Palestinians in Gaza, though she denied it warrant of an arms embargo which is exactly what it did, as we mentioned yesterday. We got the letter from Blinken and, and Lloyd Austin. They made it clear, if you don't you know, shape up with your humanitarian aid to uh, the citizens of uh, Gaza, we're going to withhold some of the arms. So it's definitely a threat of that. They issued a threat of cutting off arms earlier this week in a letter to Israeli officials. The letter was leaked, and the Biden-Harris administration confirmed the threat, caused an outcry, including pr protests from former Israeli ambassador to the U.S., Michael Oren, who said that the threat by the administration cast doubt on America's dependability as an ally and its commitment to defend the free world. And that's an understatement. There's, you know, with, with this administration, um, commitments don't mean a whole lot. Look at what happened in Afghanistan. Look what's going on in the rest of the world. And so uh, it's terrible that they added to this because remember what they've done. They've told Israel, now, don't reply too hard to Iran for their bombing and trying to destroy your country. Don't hit their nuclear sites. Don't hit their oil fields. Uh, if you don't, you know, if you do very little damage, we'll pay you some money. We'll give you something uh, for not hitting them and then uh, threatening them that now uh, we will withhold weapons in the future, delivery of certain weapons that you all, we've already agreed to sell to you uh, unless you go shape up with the humanitarian aid to Gaza. So it's really, really ridiculous. So Harris said, yeah, she agrees with that, although she said denied it's an embargo. And but you but remember, we recall earlier, she was open to discussing an arms embargo to Israel in the early days of her campaign, though the campaign had to walk that back because of the outrage and the outcry. And it, believe me, if she becomes president, that will be something that'll be at the top of her list. All right. Headline number three this is from the New York Post. Uh, they do an excellent job in looking at this whole situation. Michael Goodwin, who's a great writer there, he wrote it. Uh, editorial called Biden's betrayal of Israel is clear weakness and it's masquerading as policy. And this is really what we've been emphasizing. And it points out what the Bible predicts in the last days, the U.S. will not be a player. And we've shown that the last four years. Israelis are fighting for their lives on several fronts, he writes. So naturally, President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris decided it's a good time to tie their hands and publicly threaten them. Whose side are you on? Sadly, he writes, it doesn't seem to be Israel's, nor is it America's 
when they insist Israel go easy on terrorists who aim to destroy America after they destroy Israel. We've talked about that. Uh, the Ayatollah was very clear. The, the two bombs they need, one for the big Satan, well, one first for the little Satan, Israel, and then for the big Satan, the United States. So we're in the crosshairs also. Okay. And he says, even to call the White House approached uh, policy is overly generous. It's more of a gut reaction born of weakness that sees any expression of American or Israeli power as dangerous. And this is how these people look at it. We're, we're, you know, they don't have America first in view. They don't think America's power should be shown or Israeli power is dangerous. Thus, their instinct is always called for a peaceful status quo, even when it is temporary and rewards the enemy. And Afghanistan offers an example of the disastrous consequences of cutting and running. The defeatist pattern over Israel's war began earlier this year in a way to appease Muslim American voters. And that's the key. And anti-Semitic college students who want to feed Israel to the wolves and were angry that Democrats didn't comply. And this is election year strategy. As the nominee, a nervous Biden reacted by turning the screws on Israel and later had the Secretary of State is Tony Blinken, who has zero military experience to dictate which targets in Gaza Israel could strike. Now, as the election draws close, Michael Goodwin writes, uh, uh, Harris is the nervous nominee. The White House is tightening the screws again. This time it's taking a multi-front approach with Washington simultaneously demanding our allies show restraint in Lebanon, remember we've got that too, and Iran, and allow increased amounts of humanitarian aid into Israel. In other words, he told them not to bomb Beirut, not to bomb the oil fields, not to bomb the nuclear sites. Be easy on these enemies. These people are trying to destroy you. All right, but make sure you get lots of humanitarian aid to the enemy, which means it goes directly to Hamas. It does not go to the people there. So anyway, in other words, Israel should raise the white flag until the American election is over. If it doesn't, the U.S. threatens to join France and other in imposing an arms embargo on the beleaguered Jewish state. The urge to protect Israel's enemies is doubly bizarre when they also happen to be America's enemies. Yet this is the impact of the positions of America's taking and demanding it, it, it is making. Uh, again, Israel must comply with this. Notice that Biden and Harris are not making a single demand of any other party and no one else faces ultimatums. None for Iran, none for Hamas, none for Hezbollah, just for Israel. Isn't that interesting? Israel alone is being held responsible for the care and feeding of Gaza civilians, even though Hamas uses them as human shields. Why aren't Jordan and Egypt pushed to help to care for these their fellow Arabs? And in the previous war, uh, was the country that had been attacked required to risk the lives of its military to care for and, and his enemy civilians? And actually, he asked the question, in what previous war? And I ask the great question. Was the country that had been attacked required to risk the lives of its military to care for the enemy civilians? The answer is zero, none. Hamas could end the war in Gaza immediately, as we know. Yet there's no White House demand for the terror group's leader to come out of their tunnels, surrender, and re release all the hostages, including Americans that are still being held. Similarly, there's no demand that Hezbollah, Hezbollah stop firing into Israel. Instead, the Lebanese prime minister said he's received American guarantees that Israeli strikes in Beirut, Hezbollah's stronghold will be reduced, according to Al Jazeera. Neither the Arab outlet nor the Israeli media say who made the guarantee, but suspicion falls on Blinken, the errand boy who has led the charge against Israel all along. So anyway, what we have now, they're basically dictating what Israel's supposed to do, give aid, make sure to give plenty of humanitarian aid to Gaza, which of course feeds the fighters of Hamas or st who are still there, and don't bomb the nuclear sites, don't bomb the oil fields, don't bomb Beirut, where the headquarters of Hezbollah is, and um, do what we say, and then everything will be fine. So this this is what's terrible, um, it, it not supporting Israel. And as we've said before, in our book, 25 Signs, we're near the end, Signs uh, 9 through 11, talk about the Ezekiel 38, 39 invasion that'll take place in the future. It's not taking place now. It's not even on the horizon right now. Sorry. A uh, number of things must happen to get it there. But the United States will not be a player in the last day's Bible prophecy. We're conspicuous by our absence. And that we've talked about many, many times. And that's under sign number 11 there. Something will happen in the United States. And it's happening right now. We're destroying ourselves from within. So anyway, again, free download from our website, Educating Our World. So here's where we're at. Headline number four. This is from Ynet. Preparing to attack Iran guarantees to U.S. Russian pressure and the possible targets. It's been two weeks since Iran attacked Israel. There has been no response yet. 
U.S. received guarantees, supposedly, that Iran's oil and nuclear facilities will not be the targets. At least this time, they won't be the targets. Russia is also pressing for limited retaliation. And the Defense Minister Gallant, as we've already quoted twice, has said, our response will be precise, painful, and surprising. So we'll wait and see. Now, two weeks have passed since they launched these over 200 or nearly 200 ballistic missiles at Israel. There's still no Israeli response. U.S. believes it has received these guarantees from Israel that the, the responses won't include these two sacred areas for them, the oil fields, the nuclear facilities. But these assurances do not extend to future attacks. So we'll see what happens there. Netanyahu is expected to hold, and here's the key, consultation regarding the response on Friday. That would be tomorrow. Again, tonight, Thursday night there in Israel, you've got the end of uh uh, Sukkot, the, the, what, the end of the first day of Sukkot, so the eight-day festival, uh, tabernacles or temporary shelters. So it's a feast that lasts the whole time. And many things are shut down during this time. Now, now it's a little different because of the wartime. But supposedly, he's going to hold a um, limited consultation on Friday, tomorrow. Then on Sunday, the political security cabinet will convene and figure out what to do. So at its earliest, it, it may be next week. They may wait till the eight days are over of the... Uh, Feast of the uh, the festival of the temporary shelter, we just don't know. So it's taking a while. So we're still in a holding pattern. But we do know this, whatever happens, Israel will still survive. This will not be a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. It's not predicted this uh, temporary, this uh, regional war, if it does take place. Um, like many wars that Israel has seen in its history, were not predicted specifically in Scripture. But it's the trend has been predicted, of course. And so that's why it's important that we need to know exactly what the Bible says and what it does not say about what's going to happen at the time of the end. And that's why we do what we do in some of these uh, programs we're going to be uh, doing in the future, talking about even though it's popular to believe certain things <clears throat> are predicted in Scripture, we're going to find out they really aren't. And we we'll go through them after we get done with the, uh, the fall festivals and talk about how that doesn't work either. All right. Anyway, I'm Don Stewart. Thank you so much for watching. And until next time, as always, may the Lord richly, richly bless.